The year is 2024, and Kubernetes has been out for almost a decade now. So why are more people than ever looking for alternatives and better ways to do DevOps than Kubernetes? Hi YouTube, I'm Alexander Matoni, co-founder and head of engineering at Cycle.io, and today we're going to be talking about the top three reasons why people are looking for alternatives to Kubernetes and trying out other DevOps platforms and tools. Let's dive right in. Reason number one, overall complexity and learning curve. It's no secret that Kubernetes is one of the hardest tools to learn in DevOps. There are numerous articles, numerous tutorials, and online guides to teach you how to do Kubernetes, but in the end, it's just extremely complicated. The reasons for that are simple. Originally, Kubernetes was designed by Google for Google to solve Google-sized problems. It was called the Borg internally and was used to manage Gmail. Now, if you're just getting started learning Kubernetes, you're going to find that there are many different things you have to be familiar with. You have to be familiar with microservice-based architecture, containerization, networking, cloud-native technologies, the list goes on and on. Um, so as you begin this journey, you're easily overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that you need to know just to be able to get started. Now, sure, it's easy to find a tutorial where you can copy and paste a few commands and get something basic up and running within maybe an hour or so. But when it comes to production ready workloads, there is a lot more involved. You're just seeing the tip of the iceberg when it comes to configuring Kubernetes for those kinds of production ready workloads. That brings me to reason number two, decision fatigue. Because with Kubernetes being open source, there are a lot of people involved in the decision making of where the platform goes. Uh, today, Kubernetes is being stretched out to be everything to everybody. And for the end consumer, that means that you actually have not one, not 10, but maybe 50 different decisions you need to make to build out the production platform that you actually need to run your business. For example, uh, you might have to ask yourself early on certain questions like, what service mesh am I gonna use? What cloud providers are we going with? How are we gonna handle DNS? How are we gonna handle upgrades? Uh, all of these decisions stem from the very base that you've already set up to support that production ready ecosystem. Now, as you're designing and developing these different solutions to your problem, uh, and you're making these individual decisions, piecing them together like Legos, what you end up doing is locking yourself into those decisions early on. So once you're down the road a little further and you realize, oh, hey, that version of XYZ that we're using, this type of service mesh, whatever, doesn't work for us, you now are responsible for going back and updating your system to use something else. And there's a lot of cost and a lot of uh, effort involved in making that kind of a change. This brings me to reason number three, ongoing management costs. Just because your Kubernetes cluster is online doesn't mean that your problems stop there. In fact, they're probably just beginning. A couple of weeks ago, there was a critical security vulnerability announced for Run C, which is the runtime that powers Docker, Kubernetes, and even Cycle. Um, that would allow somebody to break out of their containerized environment or during an image build and gain access to the host machine. Horrifying, I know. Now, if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, the responsibility is on you to make sure that all of your systems are up to date. Now, maybe you're using a managed service or something else, but you still need to stay within that window and make sure that you're using the latest version so that you're not susceptible to that kind of a vulnerability. And if you look at the recent Datadog report that shows that the vast majority of Kubernetes installations are somewhere around 16 months out of date, you start to see a huge problem. Critical infrastructure, banks, underlying technologies of our economy, uh, who knows what else is being powered by Kubernetes, are all running versions that are potentially months and months and months out of date. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to do the same thing with your personal desktop or personal laptop, you might have a problem and you could easily be hacked. Add on to that that maybe it's not just the Kubernetes base that's out of date, but one of the dozens of other services that you're using to facilitate your production DevOps ecosystem, and the cost for maintaining is just an ongoing constant problem. Now that Kubernetes has been out for a while, companies that have adopted it early on are looking back and asking themselves, has the ongoing maintenance and management costs of running this Kubernetes stuff actually made us a better business? And for a lot of them, the answer is a resounding no. All of that begs the question, if not Kubernetes, then what? Now, obviously, as a co-founder of Cycle, I'm a little bit opinionated on that answer, but I want to give a little bit of context on how we resolve some of these problems. Number one, the complexity issue. Cycle started out with a user interface and was designed to be extremely easy and accessible to use, but with all of the power and capabilities that we wanted to put into a full-fledged DevOps platform from the start. Powering that user interface is a super robust API, the same one that the interface actually consumes, made available to our users. 
Now, the really cool thing about that is they're able to start with something super accessible, get something up and running, and then as time goes on, dive deeper and deeper into the levels of the platform to achieve the goals that they need. All the while, our customer success team is holding their hand and answering questions. Where the platform really shines, though, is reducing decision fatigue. From the start, everything on Cycle was designed and built from the ground up to work together in order to solve the, the question of DevOps. It's one unified platform where you don't need to decide on service meshes or load balancing or anything else. Everything that you need to do a fully enterprise grade production ready DevOps platform is built in and ready to go from the start. So bringing it full circle, the final problem of long-term management on Cycle, we actually have a really unique approach. On Cycle, we are able to push regular updates that are seamless and invisible to our users without causing any sort of downtime. So when there's a critical security vulnerability or we add a new feature or some kind of new functionality, our users are able to get that update without even knowing it half the time. That critical container security vulnerability I mentioned earlier, we had that patched in four hours and delivered to all of our customers before they even knew that the problem existed in the first place. We call this approach low ops and similar to low code, it means that you're able to do a lot more with your DevOps with a lot fewer resources. It's taken a long time for our approach to DevOps to be validated, but today, more than ever before, we're seeing more and more people move to Cycle and other DevOps alternative platforms from Kubernetes. If you're curious and wanna learn more about Cycle, check out some of the links that I've posted below. One of them is to schedule a demo and a member of our team will go through the platform with you, answer any questions that you have and show you what we're all about. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.